We ended up leaving in September of 2007 with the hope of reconciling my marriage, but by the end of 2008, we had gone through counseling and different things even after we left. And I told him, I want to work with you. I want to work through things. I want to restore our marriage, but I said, I don't want to be treated the way I've been treated. You know, I don't want to deal with the pornography. I started to stand up for myself finally. And by the end of 2008, then I found out he had a girlfriend. And at that point I was like, I can't do this anymore. Welcome to the Brand New Me Podcast. I'm Frances. And I'm Pam. And we are two women passionate about helping others thrive in life, not just survive. In each episode, we're going to find creative ways to offer hope for your future through our own life experiences. So join us every week as we learn together that we really can be a brand new me. Welcome to episode number 29. Plato once said, Be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. This young woman we have on today came into my studio. Pam had heard her story and said, We need to have her on the podcast. And I said, Yes. And she came in. She's a beautiful young woman, and you would never know what she had to go through in her life. But she sat down and started telling us her story, and I was just amazed, and I think you will be too. So today, we present to you Kristen Germain. She doesn't have a website. She doesn't have a book, but she has a story. So today we have Kristen Germain on with us, and we are very excited to talk with Kristen. I met Kristen uh, about a year ago, I guess, and she was having a conference, and she needed little baskets, giveaways, and so uh, I thought, well, I think I'll get a basket ready for her, and we met, and she's a wonderful woman. She has a beautiful vision, and so we're so glad to have you, Kristen. I grew up in New York and um, as a child my parents got divorced when I was three. After that my mom got together with my stepfather who um, actually sexually abused me so God had to work through that with me. Um, But I came here to Pennsylvania to go to college. I went to Lancaster Bible College. I went there for two years and graduated from there and moved back to New York and then was praying about where God wanted me to be. So I Um, came back here to Lancaster, I guess it was a a few months after I graduated from college and met some friends and decided that, you know, this was where God wanted me. And so started praying and asking God, okay, if this is where you want, I didn't have a car, I didn't have a job. And so I started to just pray about it. And so in December of 1993, I moved here to Pennsylvania and have been here ever since. Shortly after um, I moved here, I ended up getting a job and um, worked here for a while. And then I was a single girl, just praying about who God would have in my life and that kind of thing. And started dating a guy. I was probably, I was maybe 25 at the time. Started dating a guy and just felt like that was who God wanted me to marry. And so we fell in love and got married. And after we got married, it was uh, it was a challenge, as most marriages are, but um, shortly into our marriage, he um, got involved in pornography. And so from there, just it was a journey of just um, a challenge um, in, in our marriage. And um, eventually, he started to be physically abusive and also um, emotionally, mentally. <laughs> and so it was just a really hard time. Eventually, I started opening up and uh, shared with him or shared with friends um, what was going on, and they started praying for me and just encouraging me that, you know, Kristen, this isn't what God wants for you, you know. And But as a Christian, I could not imagine leaving my husband because as a Christian growing up, you know, you just think you have to stay there for better or worse. So... 
I, um, you know, decided that, you know, this was the decision I would make, and I started planning my getaway, so to speak, so... So during that time, you actually became pregnant, and you became a mom. I did. So tell us a little bit about your your little boy. Well, my little boy is now 13, (laughs) so he's not so little anymore, (laughs) but um, he was a joy, and you know, with marriages, you have ups and downs, and you know, it wasn't always bad, but he was born on January 13th of 2004, and he's just been the biggest joy of my life. He's just a sweet boy. So how long into your marriage were you married when this started happening? Um, the abuse, you mean? Yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was probably a good year or two into it wow. is when so it started happening. It wasn't long. So did you have any kind of inclination that he was going to be like this uh, before you married him? Do you think it was new for him? Like, had he struggled with pornography when you were dating? No, when we were dating, he was the best guy. I mean, he treated me like gold. He did all the right, all the right things. You know, he gave me flowers. He um, was just the kindest um, person. You know, I wouldn't have married him yeah. <laughs> had I seen that. But I was dealing with working through the, all of the sexual abuse and things, you know, when I met him. And so sometimes they say you attract things to yourself. Yeah. And so I um, started just working through that. And then, like I said, I I think honestly once he got we didn't have a computer when we were first married and so once we got a computer then things started to really change and he started mm-hmm. looking for an old girlfriend um, you know and I'd ask him about that because of course it made me feel <laughs> like you know, aren't I enough <laughs> you know and so he basically like I said just things started to change and then I became a detective because I felt like he would tell me I was crazy or I was jealous or um, that kind of thing and so I wanted to have the evidence that I wasn't. Kind of did some research, and then that's how I found out, you know, he was getting involved in pornography. And it started out by just really looking for an old girlfriend, and it just kind of kept progressing from there. And I truly believe that maybe those things were there prior to us meeting and him, you know, us getting married. But I think that pornography is just a slippery slope. And I think a lot of men and women get involved with it, and then they don't intend to, because by the time... I had left then. Um, it was like eight years, and I had come, you know, said to him, "This is just super hurtful, and you know, why are you continuing to do this?" And he's like, "Well, I can quit at any time, mm-hmm. but here we are, eight years later, and he's still into pornography." I became, I think, an object of his abuse, and he just felt like I wasn't a person anymore. It was just, it was very heartless. It's hard to explain. You just don't feel like you matter. It was so hurtful because it was like just being ignored was like being feeling like you're less than a person, you know, and so it was just really, <laughs> it was really a hard time, you know, going through that season of my life. I think with any of us who might struggle with something, it might not be pornography, but anytime there's a weakness in us, frailty of some kind in our humanness, it opens the door, I think, to things like that. Yes. And so not, not to judge him or condemn him but just to understand, and for others who might be out there in a marriage struggling with this, especially, you know, if you didn't see signs before. And I think even if you did see signs before you were dating, I mean, you you would work through that together, I think. Right. right? You would try to. Yeah, because you're in love. So, yeah. You're in love. Right. So you you chose to leave. Tell us a little bit more about that decision, how that came about. Sure. What you did. Sure. (laughs) Basically what happened was, you know, I was just praying a lot. I started opening up to some friends because everything was hidden. And the thing was, you have to remember, my family lived in New York. Mm -hmm. I came here, so we had no family around. So I felt very alone. Even though I had a church family, I felt very alone in my journey because most people portray their marriages as nothing's wrong. There's no problems. (laughs) Here I have this really huge problem and, you know, I'm going to God, but don't feel like I can tell anyone else. So just through a series of events, you know, I finally worked up the courage and I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to leave. What spurred that on was I was at home one morning and we altered our schedule so that I could watch my son, our son in the mornings. And then he would, we would meet each other in a parking lot at work. And then he would go home, take AJ with him. And then I would go, you know, back to work at that point. And so 
the one morning I was home and I was looking on the computer and I hadn't even plugged it into the printer yet, but I found what I needed, plugged the computer into the printer and it starts printing. And I'm thinking, that's crazy. <laughs> like, I didn't even press print yet. So out pops this nude woman. And I just like screamed because <laughs> I was like, I, at that point, I guess I had thought that things were getting better. And he was, you know, cause he would tell me he wasn't doing it anymore. So I trusted him maybe being a little naive. It was that moment that I saw that. And I was just like, okay, Kristen, I'm like, what are you going to do? Are you going to just keep living this life? Are you going to do something to change it? And I went and met him that day. And I remember him being in the driver's seat. And I was standing at the passenger door. And AJ was back in his car seat. And I said to him, I said, interesting thing today. I said, um, I was on the computer. And I found, you know, the stuff I needed. And I had the paper with me because I finally had my evidence that I needed. (laughs) And I said, and it was interesting. I said, out pop this. And I showed him the picture. Of course, he kind of was like very silent, but he grabs the picture. And of course, I'm thinking, oh, sure, look at it one more time you know, in front of me, you know. And so at that point, AJ um, was being potty trained. And so he's like, mommy, I have to go potty. So we all go into my job. And I helped AJ and then came out. And he looked at me and he said, I don't know where that came from. It must have been the other computer. Well, the other computer was never even hooked up to the Internet. So I knew he was lying. And I looked at him and I just said, okay. And I remember praying in my mind. I was like, God, I can't convict this man of his sin or what he's doing. You have to do that. And so would you just take care of the situation? But I knew if it was that blatant that he would look at me and he would tell me, he didn't do this or whatever. I mean, it had a date on it from a few days earlier. You know, he had been doing our taxes. And so I knew it hadn't just popped up out of nowhere. I knew it was, you know, what I needed. But I feel like God gave that to me as a sign that, Kristen, it's okay. I'm with you through this journey. And so I can help you with this. At that point, I started to plan my getaway and I did it very secretly, secretively. That was like March of... I guess it was 2007, and by September of 2007, I ended up leaving him. I left a note on the table, and um, it was the scariest day of my life, I will say. But God has been so faithful. I don't think you were naive. I think you were just very trusting. And there is a, there's a fine line there. Mm-hmm. But you chose to live with this man, you loved this man, right? and you trusted this man. Yes. And so we do have to make our choices But I I feel that God really allowed that to happen, to free you. But tell me, like, what what were you thinking as far as AJ? Were you thinking, oh, he's not going to have a father? Were you thinking his father may totally reject him? Honestly, when I was leaving, I thought a lot about AJ because it was, of course, it was all those things. It was like, what damage am I going to do to him? What is going to be the repercussions of my decisions? But at the end, I really left so that I could reconcile with him, with his dad, because I knew hopefully if I leave, that will shock him into wanting to change, you know, and be like, oh, I want my marriage and my kid and all this stuff. I did think of all those things with AJ, you know, but now looking back all these years, I'm so thankful I did it when AJ was three because he was, he had no idea what was going on and he doesn't remember those times. I mean, I remember days when he was getting in his anger and rage and things. And I mean, I just scooped AJ up and we were like hiding in his room (laughs) just to keep him safe. It was one of those situations that I knew we had to we had to leave to be able to change change it with the hope that we would get back together and that our marriage would be restored. How did you choose who to share your story with? There was a few ladies who were watching AJ at the time. Like I said, we didn't have our family, so we we did find some trusted individuals that would help us out, like on a Monday and Friday. And the one lady just was a very, very godly woman, and you know, I knew I could trust her, and so I started to t- to share with her. Then I would go to work and. You know, the one time he had really beat me up really well and um, went to work and I told her about it. And, you know, and right away she was like, Kristen, this isn't right. 
date, you know, and things. But, you know, I was still hanging on to my marriage because sure. I felt like, first of all, it was very scary because I'm living in my comfortable home and being married and all of this. And to think about leaving was a very, very scary thing because you think, how am I going to provide for myself? How am I going to provide for my son? My family is how many miles away? How did you decide you had to prepare financially? You had to prepare location-wise, where to live. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. There was a lady who I met through AJ's daycare, and she just happened to come up to me in the parking lot <laughs> one day and was like, she's like, do you like it here? And she was asking me all these questions. Well, we became friends. And slowly I started opening up to her, and she had a little boy who was three at the time, and AJ was three. And so we just started hanging out. I started telling her, and so she actually said to me, you know, when I decided I was leaving, um, she had offered her home. She talked to her husband, and she off they offered their home because they lived in a pretty good-sized house. And so they said, if you want to come live with us, that would be fine. But I had been planning to go. I had gone to the Lancaster, the domestic violence services, and I was planning to live in the shelter and take him, you know, the day I left until we could find another secure place. But it happened that she offered her home and I felt comfortable with that, you know, and her husband actually worked for the attorney general in Harrisburg. So I felt a little safety in yes. that, yeah. you know, <laughs> and stuff because he's a lawyer. And so, you know, it made it it, it made me feel safe that that was a good solution, you know, but I had a car dealership that changed cars with me so that he wouldn't know I was in the area the day that I left. He would leave very early in the morning to go to work, and so they came probably at like six in the morning, and we just loaded up all three of our cars with our things, and I went and got AJ and had found passwords for the money because he had controlled all of our money. So I found passwords for to get some money from the bank and things, which actually was a miracle when I look back at it. So I was able to take some money, and actually that's how he found out something was going on because he would monitor our money every day, apparently. And so he was very freakish about that. <laughs> so we, um, you know, ended up taking everything, and I left with, we ended up leaving in September of 2007 with the hope of reconciling my marriage. But by the end of 2007, 2008, we had gone through counseling and different things, even after we left, because I left with the intention, and I told them, I want to work with you, I want to work through things, I want to restore our marriage, but I said, I don't want to be treated the way I've been treated, you know, I don't want to deal with the pornography. I started to stand up for myself, finally, and by the end of 2008, then I found out he had a girlfriend, and at that point, I was like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. yeah. I do not wish what you've been through on anyone. But I do wish a community of people to help others like that have helped you. Yes. Uh, I mean, to, to think about this, to think it through, to plan it out, to carry it out with the goal, an honorable goal, to try mm -hmm. to reconcile. I mean, you must have been afraid that he would come after you, that he would... Uh, I, we talk, what does a woman go through when your first week or two, or mm -hmm. were you so surrounded by people that... You always had someone with you, like, yeah. that first week, tell us about that. Gosh, even the first day, you know, I was just scared to death, and I remember I'll never forget that day, ever. My parents actually came from New York, and they were going to take AJ to a campground so that, you know, he wouldn't know where we were. And because I was, I got a lot of counsel, as you can imagine. I got a lot of advice from different counselors, and the one counselor said, you know, even a man who has no temper can totally lose it when his wife leaves. So I planned to the nth degree. I was going to do everything possible to stay safe, you know, and keep AJ safe, because I thought, if he has a temper when we're married, I'm like, what is he going to be like when I leave? But apparently when I left, he was very broken and he was calling me and calling me and things. But I was so in a panic and every time he would call me, it would like make my stomach sick because I was just like, what if he finds me? What if, you know, this or that? And I even actually... I had a different car, of course, like we talked about, and I actually passed him on the road, and it just jolt jolted me because I was like, what if he sees me, and what if, you know, and I wasn't that far from my friend's home, you know, where we were staying, and so it was a very scary time, but the first few weeks were just going into just 
like safe mode and trying to, you know, my friends were very good about keeping me safe who were we, we were living with. They were ready to file like a PFA or whatever if he decided that he was going to come to the house. I had other friends. I mean, they were just praying for me. Um, what I did too is through the time that I was opening up to different ladies, I had probably a handful of friends who I asked to pray for me. And I said, I just need you when I contact you, you know, because we didn't have like Facebook. I wasn't on it back then. <laughs> and stuff. So I would send emails, you know, and it was my way of feeling like, you know, I didn't have to say five stories at a time, you know, right. five different times. I could say one story. Everyone got the same story. I knew that they would start praying. And so oftentimes when I would feel overwhelmed, I would send emails. And as soon as I sent the email, it was like, God just brought a peace to me, you know, because mm -hmm. I knew these ladies were serious prayer warriors. They, you know, they weren't just like, Hey, I'll pray for you. See ya. Right. <laughs> you know, kind of What's thing. Your name? <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, exactly. So, so let's just say three to five things you would say must be in place. If a wife is facing some of the same things you have, and this gives her some ideas and some hope. What are three to five things she must know and do? Well, I would say, first of all, get into counseling because a good counselor will help direct you through the right steps. If it is an unsafe situation, you need to start seeking people who you can feel safe with to tell them your story and then start talking to your pastor, people who are in your life that can help you through the situation because in a very serious situation and there have been a lot in the news about these men who will actually go after their wives or girlfriends and they end up dead. You know, and that was my fear that if I went back too soon that it would be dangerous for me and my son because it was a very, very bad situation and it wasn't as bad as maybe some women go through, but for him to beat me up a few times is enough. It really is really digging deeper into God, but you need to find people who are going to help you practically, who will say, you know what, if you need a place to stay, then you can stay with me. People who are friends of these people, they need to step up. They need to offer practical like food and shelter and things like that. And for your, your children, just to offer them love, because again, we didn't have our family here. So I was, I had to depend on all these different friends and thank God they stepped up. But I think when a woman is in a situation like that, the biggest, hardest thing is finding a person who can be safe enough that they can share and that it will be a person who will take them by the hand and say, we're going to change this. And like you said, you have to have wisdom and the people who are dealing with the person who's in the situation need to have wisdom as well to not make too quickly moving things because you want to set up a plan to make sure it's safe. Because that's why I plan from March to September because I knew like I had to be careful of every move I made because I didn't want him to be led on to the fact that I was leaving because I felt like that would put me in more danger. Yeah. And so did you have to alert your work? That this was I did. happening. I did. I did. I let my um, employer know, and it's funny because I think he must have forgotten or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it was for me, it was the most crazy day, but you know, I told him I was going to be not at work that day. And my ex, my, well, my husband at the time ended up calling him and he told him that I was off of work. And as soon wow. as he did that, yes, it was like, that was the one thing that messed up my plan. Oh, I know. <laughs> so, so I was like, okay, Jesus help me. <laughs> so, you know, so that put me in a panic mode because my biggest fear was him going to the daycare to get AJ. And I knew I had to be the one to get AJ because I could see him using him as a tool to kind of manipulate what? the yes. situation. Good word. Thank you. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so yeah. So that was a little bit of a glitch, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but the daycare people, they also knew what was going on. And so I called them immediately and I just said, please do not let him take my son. And they probably should not have abided by that because there was no custody order. There was no orders at all, you know, and so it was one of those things that they trusted me and they knew they could see from, you know, when I would talk to them, they could see how his dad was different. They could see and they've dealt with other people who are like this. So they were, they helped me and thankfully I got AJ and uh, the rest is kind of history. 
So Kristen, God has brought you full circle, but you know, this isn't really the, the end of your story. And we would love our listeners to hear, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of your story. But do you have a just a small word of advice maybe for somebody who's going through this right now? Yes, I would say don't be afraid to speak out and don't be afraid to reach out to trusted friends. That would be my biggest thing because people want to help, but they can't help if they don't know what is happening. And is there a website you could point people to where they could start? Now, this is the fun thing about your story. We're catching you at the beginning of a vision of a ministry and what God has done through your story. Right. But you don't have a website or anything yet, which is I think is really cool because um, people get to see people in different parts of their dreams. And that's what we're going to hear next week, part of your dream and what's happening now. But even a domestic violence website, like where can a woman start? Yeah, I think to Google, just Google domestic violence services, that would be an area that you could look at. They have a lot of resources on there. There's one in each town and city that girls could or ladies could reach out. Okay. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you for having me.